Isabel Dos Santos was the richest woman in Africa in 2020, and Forbes estimated her wealth amounted to $1.4 billion. Her story begins in the Republic of Angola, a country on the west coast of southern Africa. Her journey to wealth started in 1974, just two years after Dos Santos was born. Her father, Jose Dos Santos, was put in charge of the Republic of Angola's foreign affairs. Jose, born in 1942, served his native Angola in the military and low political positions. He used this experience to climb the political ladder in just five years. However, the ladder he climbed was on fire and covered by political opponents involved in a civil war to control Angola. Jose just so happened to come out on top. In 1979, he was elected to the head of Angola's armed forces, and later that year, the entire nation. The young nation was supposed to hold democratic elections, but Jose didn't leave office until 2017. On one occasion in 2001, Jose promised the people he would step down. However, when election day came around, Jose won anyway and served 16 more years as president of Angola. Helping him run the show were his three children, of which Isabel was the oldest and most ambitious. By being the dictator's oldest child, Isabel was under tight pressure to do her part in governing Angola. Although she was never elected by any Angolans, Dos Santos was appointed to the head of an Angolan oil company in 2016. Many in the Angolan media saw the move as corrupt nepotism. On the other hand, Isabel was actually more qualified than most, at least on paper. Her parents, Jose and Tatiana, sent their daughter to a prestigious school in London, where a young Dos Santos received one of the best educations planet Earth had to offer. Dos Santos got to work right out of school, using her father's connections to enter the business world on behalf of her fellow Angolans. One of her biggest partners was the Portuguese. Ironically, Portugal used to govern Angola as their colonial rulers, but kept close ties with their former subjects through tight economic relationships. Dos Santos helped keep these relationships strong by investing millions into Portuguese businesses. She's pumped money into their telecommunications industry, fashion, and retail. Dos Santos also acquired companies and invested capital into others, making herself millions of dollars down the road as her investments grew. Her biggest deal with the Portuguese occurred when Dos Santos created an international telecommunications beast called Unitel. Unitel was part Angolian and part Portuguese. Dos Santos used the company to create jobs in Angola by implementing training programs for engineers, technicians, and several other positions that would help boost Angola's economy. By 2016, Dos Santos was worth over $2 billion and still breaking through the business world. Yet, it seems strange that Dos Santos was still getting help from her old man, Mr. President or Mr. Dictator to most. But Jose was a family man, and so was his daughter. Despite being constantly busy with work, Dos Santos made time to start a family of her own. In 2002, Dos Santos married Syndica de Colo. De Colo was a businessman hailing from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He invested his money similarly to his wife in Portuguese industries. Where did he get all this money? De Colo, like his wife, grew up in an affluent home. His father was a millionaire who made his fortune from banking in European markets. The rich tend to marry rich, and the Dos Santos family was no exception. De Colo and his wife made a great team spending their family's money on smart investments in Portugal and Angola. It was a match made in heaven. Eventually, Dos Santos' success caught the attention of Forbes magazine. Since most billionaires are usually white men, the business media giant decided to write a piece on Dos Santos, the richest woman in Africa. They portrayed Dos Santos as a successful businessman, but with a twist. Forbes gave Dos Santos credit for her accomplishments. However, they made it clear that Dos Santos could not have become a billionaire without her father, the most powerful man in Angola. Her father gifted Dos Santos an oil company in the same way regular dads would buy their kids a Toyota or an outdoor swing set. Her journey to become a billionaire seemed like a classic case of socioeconomic privilege. But Dos Santos was much more than privileged. Forbes and everyone else were making the wrong assumptions and asking the wrong questions. The most important question being, where did she get her initial investment capital? One group of journalists finally asked the question and dug up some shocking answers. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or ICIJ, is a network of 280 journalists who communicate across borders to take down corrupt governments and stop crime. 
they decided to investigate Dos Santos and her business operations. The question of where she got her investment capital lingered over Dos Santos' business like a puffy white cloud until the ICIJ blew the cloud away with the now infamous Luanda leaks. After years of digging, the ICIJ published a report in January 2020 they dubbed the Luanda leaks after the capital city of Angola. The report revealed information that, if proved true in court, would cost Dos Santos her entire fortune. Coincidentally or not, her principal money manager mysteriously died in her garage three days after the report was published. Nuno Ribeira da Cunha was a professional banker and Dos Santos' private money manager. If there was anyone who could potentially testify against Dos Santos, providing a jury a deep dive into the richest woman in Africa's finances, it was Cunha. His death, though tragic, would appear to be advantageous for Dos Santos. However, the tragedy didn't stop Dos Santos from taking serious heat over the report. The heat came from the Angolan government freezing all her assets, even the assets she owned in Portugal, resulting in Dos Santos losing her long-held billionaire status. She went from 10 figures to zero. But why? What kind of crime did Dos Santos commit to warrant such drastic legal action? Well, as it turns out, the capital Dos Santos used to invest with over the past couple of decades didn't belong to her. It belonged to the people of Angola. The ICIJ cited 715,000 files in their report. Each file was evidence pointing to a possible truth. Dos Santos had funded her business ventures using public funds. Dos Santos and her husband were involved in building over 400 companies whose locations were sprinkled throughout the world, including 94 secret jurisdictions like Malta and Hong Kong. According to the ICIJ, all these investments were taken from public companies in Angola. In layman's terms, Dos Santos, probably with help from her father, took money from government-owned businesses and invested it without having to return it, like a free loan. These public companies were under the authority of President Jose Dos Santos for nearly three decades. He was one of the few individuals in Angola who could pull hundreds of millions out of a publicly owned entity and get away with it. Jose was criticized throughout his reign for being a nepotist. He received the most criticism for appointing his children to positions of political power, like the head of a big Angolan oil company. The critics won in the end. Isabel's tenure as the head of the Angolan oil company was short-lived. After her father Jose finally stepped down in 2017, the new president, João Lorenzo, fired Dos Santos. President João also canned Jose's other children, who he put in positions of great power. The Dos Santos era was over. If the Luanda leaks had been released four or five years earlier, Jose would have most likely swept the whole issue under the rug. However, the new president knew he had to go after Dos Santos. In addition to freezing Isabel's assets, the Angolan government froze the Colo's assets as well. They covered all of Dos Santos' bases, except a relationship with the United Arab Emirates. The UAE was one of the few countries still willing to take Dos Santos in. The UAE was also the place where Docolo died months before. His death was like something out of a campy movie. On a sunny afternoon in late October 2020, under the sparkling ocean waves of Dubai, Docolo dived down to the ocean floor without any scuba equipment. The practice is called free diving. Free divers dive without scuba gear, leading to a more natural and time-precious experience. You dive down as far as you can go, and when your lungs start screaming to your brain for air, you pop up to the surface, except Decolo never popped up. Many suspected Dos Santos had something to do with Decolo's strange and sudden death when the news got out. He had been a healthy, active man in his late 40s, and he happened to be another individual with crucial information on Dos Santos' business dealings. But after a thorough investigation, Dubai police found no evidence of foul play. Not getting prosecuted for murder was a victory within itself. However, Dos Santos still had to face prosecution from different countries. Angola wanted her to literally pay for her crimes, and they weren't the only ones. Portugal didn't throw a party when they found out millions of stolen dollars had been invested in their economy. The Portuguese business took the case to a Dutch court, which ordered Dos Santos to pay out $500 million in restitution. Contrary to the evidence and guilty court verdicts, Dos Santos still believes she's innocent. She has repeatedly claimed the legal attack on her is a political witch hunt and isn't based in reality. 
For example, immediately after her assets were frozen, the former first daughter of Angola posted a photo on Twitter ensuring the public of her innocence. As Dos Santos continues to be prosecuted by her former country, her future looks bleaker with every swing of the gavel, regardless of how innocent she claims to be. In August 2021, attorney Citra Bibankard saw a Facebook message on his board. He didn't know the sender, but clicked on their message anyway. Citra saw the sender had sent him a video. As he watched it, Citra's hands shook and his mind spun. On his screen, a group of Bangkok police tied plastic bags over a man's head as he cried and whimpered for mercy. Eventually, the man stopped crying out. When the police tried to save him, it was too late. The mysterious sender told Citra to share the video after he'd watched it. He did, and the video went viral. Many people were shocked at the sheer brutality, but more so by who they saw ordering the heinous acts. Chief Thitison Thupanifon, also known as Joe Ferrari. Why was that his nickname? He's got 26 luxury cars, a mansion, and a famous wife. And he was the police chief from Thailand, someone who made roughly $1,700 per month. The interrogation occurred on August 4th, 2021. The sender was a junior police officer who somehow got a hold of the video. He sent it to Citra, hoping he'd bring its contents to court, as well as show the public how corrupt their police are. Citra acted quickly. He took action against Joe and had him arrested. However, despite being in handcuffs, some strange things started happening after Joe's initial detainment. Shortly after being arrested, Joe held a press conference of sorts. His main motive was to convey a message that he was innocent to the people of Thailand. For days, Thailanders had seen the police chief's face on their TV and phone screens. Next to him were headlines painting a very negative picture. Joe tried to change those impressions by telling everyone he did not mean to hurt the man, and he was only trying to get information. One thing the speech could not properly explain, however, were the headlines describing Joe's wealth, cars, and mansion. It left people wondering where on earth it all came from. The truth was almost as bizarre as the video. Joe got his first taste of wealth when he married a rich girl from Thailand. By all accounts, Joe came from an ordinary family with a regular amount of money. There's no doubt the sudden exposure to lavish wealth affected the young man. In 2003, Joe graduated from the police academy, climbing his way up the ladder until he landed the chief job. During this climb, he married another well-off woman, a Thai actress. Then, after she didn't work out, he married another Thai actress, a well-known TV presenter whose father is a senior police officer in Thailand. On the surface, Joe seemed like a respectable police chief who happened to be in with the celebrity crowd. But also on Joe's surface, protruding out like a luxurious pimple, was his car collection. And the reason, he's nicknamed after an Italian automaker. If you were lucky enough to know Joe before he was arrested, you probably saw his car collection. Joe had a Ferrari, of course, but that wasn't the highlight of his garage. He had a rare Lamborghini Aventador, four Porsches, three Audis, and six Mercedes-Benz. To add an elegant touch, Joe also had a Bentley. Even though he was married to a successful actress, a car collection like that seems suspicious. His Lambo cost six figures alone. So how did Joe accumulate all this money? The police system is different in Thailand. They have something called the finder's fee that allows certain officers to take a cut from discovering and turning in stolen cars. It works like this. An officer will turn a car over to the government, who, after a trip through the court system, puts the vehicles up for public auction. For whatever price these cars sell for, the officer who turned the car in gets a 25% cut. Informants get 30%. Which means, if Joe turned over a confiscated Ferrari, and that Ferrari sold at auction for $200,000, Joe would pocket $50,000. However, recent laws have lowered those payouts to 20% each to officers and informants. Still, the finder's fee can double, triple, or quadruple an officer's salary if they're lucky enough. The reason officers earned a quarter of the auction sale was partly because of the informants. The people smuggling these cars could be very dangerous. Many of them work for millionaires and billionaires, helping them save thousands in taxes by smuggling their expensive four-wheel purchases into Thailand. They paid good money, meaning the security was willing to do whatever it took to get the cars from point A to point B. The Thai government offered the finder's fee to incentivize cops like Joe to risk their lives to stop them. Overall, authorities estimate that Joe confiscated 410 cars and cashed in on 405 of them, earning the police chief around 
$24 million. These numbers puzzled investigators on multiple levels. The first level being, how did Joe manage to confiscate that many cars? After tracing the car's collective history, investigators determined that many were stolen before being collected by Joe and his officers. With this new information, investigators believe Joe may have been involved in the smuggling himself or worked with smugglers. The numbers corroborate their theory. Of the first 270 cars confiscated, 101 were reported stolen before their seizure by police, and 169 more cars were reported stolen after being seized. Many of these cars were smuggled into Thailand from nearby Singapore and Malaysia. Given the close proximity, the likelihood of an international scam is pretty good. Some investigators even believe the buyers, the people at auction, were stealing the cars, having them smuggled into Bangkok, seized by police, then bought at auction for a lower price. While this scheme may seem like the sole source of Joe's mysterious wealth, investigators in Thailand think there may be more to the mystery than just car smuggling. When added up, authorities don't think the car scheme is enough to account for all of Joe's lavish spending. They think he was receiving money from another source. During his press conference, Joe claims he was trying to get information when he hurt the man who eventually passed away. So what kind of information was he looking for? Aside from his success in the stolen car business, Joe is also known for his tough stance on illicit drugs. When trying to explain why he engaged the man so viciously, Joe says he did so to extract essential information from a drug dealer. A few Bangkok officers paid a visit to the dealer's house posing as customers. The 24-year-old dealer and his wife tried to sell the undercover cops drugs, resulting in their immediate arrest and detainment. Then they questioned the young man. Joe said he wanted to find out who his supplier was or if he was supplying other dealers. While those sound like good intentions, many investigators have serious doubts about Joe's claims. Given the excessive force Joe put into the interrogation, some say the ex-chief asked for more than mere information. Instead, they believe Joe was trying to shake the dealer for a bribe. To most of us, corrupt officials attempting to commit bribery comes off as scandalous. But for the people of Thailand, it's a cliche image. They often experience, sometimes personally, low-level officers trying to use their position to get rich quickly. This kind of corruption occurs so often that, according to Paul Chambers, an expert from the Center of Asian Community Studies at Nerusian University, police have become a significant component of the Thai political power structure. According to Chambers, the police act like a mafia-type organization. And, much like Henry Hill and Martin Scorsese's gangster classic, many young men in Thailand dream of being a Thai police officer. Through extortion, even a low-ranking officer can make more money than their annual salary paid to them by the state. How exactly? By arresting members of the vast drug industry and giving them a simple but gracious ultimatum. Go to jail or pay me and I'll let you go. And since many dealers carry around cash or know someone who has access to it, the latter is often an easier choice to make. Since most of those bribes are made in cash, calculating the payments is difficult for investigators. So, we may never know how much bribe money Joe collected over his career. The official leading the inquiry into the six officers, National Police Commissioner General Sua Jang Yodasuk, promised to speed the process up and get a conviction as soon as possible. So far, they've been charged with coercion and abuse of authority. The most severe charge came from what happened in the viral video. Among them are many malfeasance-related charges, which means wrongdoing by a public official. Joe and his officers are also accused of covering up the incident. On the initial report for the drug dealer, which has since been corrected, his cause of passing was possible toxicity of amphetamine. And to make matters worse for Joe, he reportedly went on the run when the video was released. If these charges hold up, the six officers, including Joe, could be facing capital punishment under Thai law. The people in Thailand who watched the video were horrified, similar to America's reaction to the George Floyd footage. These days, at the top level of a multi-level parking garage in Bangkok are several Lamborghinis, Porsches, McLarens, Bentleys, and BMWs that Joe supposedly confiscated. These vehicles will eventually be sold at auction, but Joe won't receive his cut. Ironically enough, there actually aren't any Ferraris. They sit there in the dark, wearing a coat of dust. Their tires are flat, and they're soaking in a shallow pool of soupy rainwater. Perhaps these seemingly forgotten cars are the last remnants of a decade-long scam that would still be unknown if not for a viral video. As his gang of officers is investigated in the coming years, Joe's secrets will be revealed, whatever they may be. It's only a matter of time.
Here are a few of the wildest teachers out there teaching the kids. Number 11, Sharonda Johnson. Sharonda Johnson, a criminal justice teacher at Fort Pierce High School in St. Lucie County, Florida, sent out requests for field trip money. She was supposed to take her class to a competition. However, they never made it. When that didn't happen, people began questioning what was going on. Parents like Haiti Nuno were expecting a full refund, but it never happened, just like the field trip. The deception was a big hit to families like Nuno's as the money wasn't easy to come by. Nuno was quoted in an interview as saying, I was surprised because it wasn't easy for us to pay $100 a month. It was a shock to know what the teacher did with the money. Miss Johnson stole the funds for her personal benefit and stiffed the parents and children who paid the money. She blamed bad grades and being unprepared when asked about it. However, it all came crashing down rather quickly after that. All it took was for someone to look at the situation for everything to become clear. Clear. Not only was Johnson stealing their money and not providing anything to the children, she was also stealing from the school by requesting candy and other things and not paying for them. Johnson racked up $3,000 in stolen money. She got $2,500 from the parents and $500 from the school. As a criminal justice teacher, she probably knows what will happen next. Number 10, Jennifer Beatty. On an average October day in Oklahoma, a happy family decided to sell their home. The family left so their realtors could show their house to potential buyers. One of these buyers was a teacher named Jennifer Beatty, and she had no intention of purchasing the home. Instead, she seemed to be looking for something specific and headed off to the bathroom. After everything was said and done, the family came back to discover that things were missing. They had multiple prescription pill bottles go missing from their bathroom cabinets. One of the bottles was the popularly abused drug hydrocodone. Luckily, the family had a home surveillance system, so it wasn't hard for the police to figure out the culprit. After reviewing the footage, police discovered Beatty was the only one to visit that room. The officer's job was made even easier because Beatty gave her name and number to the realtors when she entered the home. Police arrested and charged her with stealing a controlled substance and stealing from a home. She was also let go by the Mustang School District. Many realtors tell their clients to remove or hide any medications and jewelry during an open house. You'd hope you can trust the people coming inside. Unfortunately, people like Beatty ruin it for everyone. Number 9. Julia White For two years, a Chesterfield County Elementary School in Virginia had problems with things disappearing. Baby wipes meant for specific children, books, teaching aids, and even a rug all went missing, leaving everyone searching for answers. Everyone except one woman, a teacher named Julia White. She was stealing items from the school, faculty, and even the children, and then selling them for a profit. Her scheme crumbled when a substitute teacher bought the stolen items off Craigslist. The substitute teacher laid down an alphabet rug on her new classroom floor on her first day. Soon, another teacher came in and remarked how it looked like her missing rug. While the situation was quickly cleared up, it made the substitute suspicious. She asked the staff about the stuff that was missing. The substitute decided to bring in all of the things she had bought from Craigslist, and teachers quickly began identifying things that belonged to them. After this discovery, the police obtained a warrant to search White's property for the missing items. They found some of the stolen goods in her garage, but she'd already sold most of it. After the investigation, White was arrested for her crimes, but this was not the first time. They discovered she'd been arrested for stealing from a Kroger a year earlier and failed to mention it to the school. When all the stolen items were tallied up, it showed White made off with around $3,000 worth of school-related items. She was charged with embezzlement, burglary, petite larceny, and grand larceny. She was let go from her teaching position and left the whole school system shortly after. Number 8. Kelly Green We've all heard the stories about teachers not getting paid enough. In Seminole, Florida, one teacher named Kelly Green decided to take the matter into her own hands. She decided that whatever she couldn't buy, she'd just get on a discount, a five-finger discount. On October 14th of 2018, Miss Green walked into a beauty store. She wasn't paid much attention, probably because she looked like the average shopper there. She walked into one of the aisles and knelt, seemingly interested in purchasing some makeup. However, after a few quick glances around herself, she began to stuff her bag full of products. She escaped with her loot that day, was far from home free. The surveillance camera caught her red-handed. When the police had a hard time identifying Miss Green, they put out a video to the public asking for help. A resource officer at Green's school recognized her and called the cops soon after. When they showed up to question her, she immediately admitted her guilt. With the evidence on tape, there wasn't much she could do but admit her crime. Miss Green stole over $500 worth of cosmetic products from the store. She was charged with grand theft and her bail was set at $2,000. Number 7. Pamela Smart 
On May 1st, 1990, Pamela Smart returned home from a meeting to find her husband dead in their home. It looked like he was shot during a burglary because the house was ransacked. The investigation wasn't really going anywhere until a local man turned up with a gun that he found in his own home. After digging, police discovered that the gun was the murder weapon. The investigation took to questioning the man's teenage son, and soon it came out that he and his friends were involved in the murder. This led to one of the first ever murder trials where cameras were allowed in. The nation watched as the whole story played out. One of the boy's friends was William Flynn, a student in Pamela's class. In the trial, she was convicted of coercing the 16-year-old to kill her husband so she could collect a life insurance policy and avoid an expensive divorce. He had three of his friends help out with the crime. The young men were tried as adults and all given pretty heavy sentences. However, Pamela was sentenced to life in prison and still sits there today while sending in parole requests. Number 6. Dominique Campbell Anyone who considers defrauding our schools should take note that we will prosecute those who steal funds intended to educate our children. This is a quote from U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid when commenting on Dominique Campbell's case. Campbell and her mother, Sandra Campbell, ran a little school scam between 2004 and 2008. Their scheme consisted of a fake company from which Detroit public schools could order books and other supplies. In reality, there was no company, and the women just pocketed the money. They ended up stealing more than $500,000 before the FBI finally caught them. After digging into their records, authorities discovered the fraud since neither reported the money to the IRS. When Uncle Sam wants his money, you better believe your scheme to steal half a million bucks from the public school system is over. The two women were convicted of program fraud conspiracy, money laundering, and tax evasion. Sandra was sentenced to 70 months in prison and was ordered to pay all of the money back. Dominique likely received a similar sentence. Number five, Bruce Bagley. Bruce Bagley seemed like nothing more than an ordinary professor at the University of Miami. Most people would take one look at his suit and messy hair and write him off as uninteresting. No one knew that hidden under his mild-mannered facade was a professional money launderer for an overseas criminal. Bagley specialized in Latin American drug trafficking and money laundering. His expert level status with his subject allowed him to create a consulting company focused on his specialization. A Colombian man named Alex Saab got in touch with him one day and wanted help with getting his son a visa. He also asked Bagley for investment advice. This eventually led to Bagley becoming Saab's money launderer for funds stolen from a Venezuelan food program. Bagley made around $250,000 through his dealings with Saab, but had to pay it back to the government once he was convicted. Bagley got caught up in an undercover sting that revealed all of his dealings with the Colombian criminal. Once in court, he pleaded guilty to his crimes. When he was sentenced, his poor health and old age were considered, and Bagley was given way less than the standard minimum sentence of four to five years. Instead, he was ordered to spend six months in federal prison and had to pay back all of the money he gained through the fraud. Number four, Laura Ramos. In the words of Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd, Laura Ramos is the lowest of the low. She betrayed her grandmother and took advantage of her in her time of need. Ramos wiped out her grandmother's life savings and to put a cherry on top, She's a teacher. Ramos was a teacher at Dundee Ridge Middle Academy when she was appointed power of attorney over her grandmother, giving her complete control over grandma's financials. However, Ramos wasn't alone. There was another person in charge of grandma's money. For years, Ramos managed her grandmother's accounts with no problems. She handled things like writing checks, withdrawing money, and paying bills. It wasn't until 2018 when the other signer on grandma's bank account passed away that things took a turn for the worse. The charges on the grandmother's account went from a very consistent three to six transaction a month to around 50. At most, the 83-year-old woman was spending just under $1,000 per month on essentials like rent, bills, food, and medication. In just one year, that account went from $66,000 to minus $193. The charges went unnoticed until one day in October 2020, when the woman went to get her own mail, she found a PayPal bill with her name on it. She knew something was up and alerted other family members. She quickly discovered her account's negative balance and her family put in their own money to save her from bankruptcy. The police were called and after a months long investigation, determined that Ramos was the thief. She'd maxed out three different credit cards in her grandmother's name, draining her of every cent she had. In March, she was arrested at the school she worked at and charged with six felonies. Number three, Megan Jones. In Jacksonville, Florida, Megan Jones, a Duval County teacher, faced a felony charge when a co-worker accused her of stealing 
prescription Adderall. On February 19th, 2020, a teacher headed to her purse after lunch at the Duval Charter School. She retrieved a bottle from the bag that was supposed to have three pills in it. To her surprise, it was empty. Concerned about where the missing pills could end up, the teacher quickly found the school on-duty officer and told them what had happened. God forbid one of the children took them. The officer decided the best course of action would be to review the surveillance tapes. A quick look at the feed showed the only person to enter the room was Jones, one of the victim's co-workers. Jones asked her for one of the pills earlier in the day. This time, she decided to steal them. Mary was questioned by police on the 21st and arrested that same day. She was later released and her case was referred to a pre-trial program. This meant that she would likely not see any jail time as long as she followed the rules. Rule number one, don't steal prescription Adderall from your co-workers. Number two, Chinese teachers. What are teachers like in the biggest country with Eastern culture? A while back, stories surfaced about Chinese teachers punishing their students. Some of these stories were nightmarish, and one even went viral. A little girl was made to kneel on frozen peas for an extended period of time. This left deep divots in her skin that would activate anyone's trypophobia, or the fear of patterns and clusters of small holes or bumps. But before this tall tale gets anyone upset, it was fake. It was an internet hoax that made the rounds before being proven false. That doesn't mean that that students are getting away with stuff and avoiding some unique, if not weird, punishments. There are many different ways for a teacher to punish an unruly student in China. Your normal run-of-the-mill punishments are extra work, deductions of daily scores, and chores. However, a lot of it seems to be based on embarrassment. A student could be made to write a self-criticism letter and read it to the class. Or they might have to copy an entire book by hand. They also have your standard exercise punishments like push-ups or running laps. Some are unique, like singing a song in front of the class. The teachers even have a little more power in China as they can make a student's parents come in and teach the class. Number one, Tabitha Lawson. On August 22nd, back in 2019, Tabitha Lawson, a teacher at John Valley Middle School in Birmingham, Alabama, reported a burglary at her school. When the police showed up, they were told a television and 11 iPads were stolen. Once the investigation began, they concluded that Lawson stole the items herself. She only called the cops to cover her tracks and make herself look innocent. When police looked through her backyard, they discovered that this wasn't her first crime. She was convicted on 10 counts of writing bad checks in 1997. Police recovered a few items from local pawn shops, but they couldn't get everything back. Lawson was arrested and taken to Jefferson County Jail. Here are a few of the wildest judges out there. Number eight, Diane Vittori Caraballo. How much money has to be involved for a judge to steal it? How much would make them break their sworn oath to uphold the law? For Judge Diana Caraballo, the price was a little over $300,000. As an attorney and judge, Caraballo had many different responsibilities. She oversaw Mahoning County Court No. 3, dealing with misdemeanors and traffic cases. She also offered estate planning services and in 2015 was hired by Robert Sampson to plan his estate. Carabello was supposed to draw up his will for him. Later that year, in November, the judge filed an administration application over Samson's estate. The form stated he died without a will. Samson's closest relation was a sister named Dolores Falgiani. A few days before the application was approved, Caraballo was also put in charge of Falgiani's will. Falgiani passed away in March of 2016, leaving Caraballo to go over her estate. She wanted her estate to be distributed among friends, family, and several animals animal charities. Caraballo had other ideas. Caraballo reported that she found $20,000 in some shoe boxes while going over everything and counted it towards the estate's value. Secretly, she'd found a lot more than that in two other locations. In total, police believe she stole about $100,000 to $325,000 in cash from Falgiani's home. Unbeknown to the judge, Falgiani had already made people aware of the money she hid away. When Caraballo's $20,000 find came up, it seemed suspicious, so the FBI began investigating. She had many chances to report the money as she filed two more reports for newly discovered assets. Never once did she report the stolen money. It wasn't long before they discovered that Caraballo was making structured payments to multiple banks with the money. Federal law requires banks to report any deposit over $10,000 to the IRS. So the crooked judge began depositing less than that at multiple banks to hide her crime. When confronted, Caraballo denied everything, but she was already caught. Once arrested and in court, she pleaded guilty to mail fraud, lying to law enforcement, and structuring cash deposits. Caraballo was convicted and sent off to a prison nicknamed Camp Cupcake, the same prison that held Martha Stewart. Police only recovered $50 worth of Falgiani's missing money. It seems like no one will ever know what the judge did with that money.
Number seven, Kaysen Moreland. Judge Kaysen Moreland was accused of receiving favors in exchange for better treatment in his courtroom. His problem all started when a woman came forward and told a Nashville news station that she had been let off on some traffic fines by Moreland, prompting the FBI to open an investigation. It didn't take long before word of the investigation got back to the judge, and now he had to dig his way out. This was when he should have stopped digging, but he just couldn't put a shovel down. His first plan was to hire a third party to meet with his accuser and pay her off. To do this, he stole around $6,000 from a non-profit charity he had control over that supported the drug court. Moreland took this to mean he could do whatever he wanted with the money coming in. However, Moreland's plan backfired. His accomplice became an FBI informant, so Moreland kept digging. Next, he came up with a plan to plant drugs in the woman's car. Then, he'd have her pulled over by police and presto, credibility destroyed. He went full burn notice, trying to accomplish all of this with a burner phone bought under a false name. This wasn't the first time he stole money that he was supposed to be protecting. It was discovered that he had actually been pulling money from the charity funds for his expenses. He admitted in court that he started embezzling in early 2016 and even tried convincing a witness to destroy documents that proved his involvement in the embezzlement. Moreland was convicted of embezzlement, obstruction of justice, and witness tampering. He was sentenced to 44 months in jail and had to pay restitution of $18,000. Number six, Mike Mirabal. In October 2021, former Judge Mike Mirabal was near his apartment complex's entrance gate in Miami, Florida, as he was out getting groceries. A man Mirabal didn't know asked him to unlock the gate. He told the former judge that he had forgotten his phone in his cousin's apartment. Mirabal asked him a question regarding which apartment he was heading to. He didn't like the response he got, so he declined to help him. At this point, the story begins to differ according to who's telling it. Mirabal reported that the man started cursing at him and saying he would fight him. However, the other man claimed that he had just started yelling for his cousin to come down. Eventually, the cousin hears the man and comes to let him in. When he heard what happened, he decided to talk with his neighbor about the situation. Once again, we have two different accounts of what happened. Mirabal stated that he was in his garage when the same man from before approached him, saying he wanted to fight. The judge claimed that he pulled his gun and placed it behind his back before warning the man that he was armed. The man and his cousin both claimed they just went to talk to Mirabal to clear everything up. Allegedly, that's when he pointed his gun, pulled back its slide twice, and began threatening them. The pair of men called the cops, and when they showed up, the judge was arrested on the spot. The 911 call backs up the cousin's story. You can hear the man on the phone with the dispatcher telling the judge to get away from him, which was heard four separate times during the call. Surprisingly, the whole ordeal wasn't Mirabal's first brush with controversy. He had recently been elected to his judicial duties in January 2021, but was forced to resign amid numerous misconduct allegations. The October incident probably didn't help his future chances. Number five, Gerald Garson. Judge Gerald Garson, a former New York Supreme Court justice, oversaw divorce and custody hearings. Most of his peers applauded him as a fair judge. However, most of those good reviews may have come off the back of bribes. Judge Garson had a whole operation that started with a fixer named Nissim Elman. Elman approached people due in Garson's courtroom with an offer. For a fee, Elman would point them in the direction of a lawyer with connections in the court. Connections to Judge Garson. This lawyer was Paul Simonofsky, and he was no stranger to the pay-to-win strategy available in Garson's court. Usually, this type of plan wouldn't work since the system randomly picks judges for each case. However, Simonofsky would bribe the court officials to ensure certain people got in front of Garson. Once bribed, Garson coached the lawyer on precisely what questions to ask and arguments to get their desired ruling. It all came to an abrupt end in 2002, when Frida Hellman tried to use this system to her advantage, only to be told that her husband had already offered a bigger bribe. Deciding she wouldn't lose that way, Frida went to the cops and told them the situation. It wasn't long before she was back in a room with Elman, wearing a wire. This meeting eventually led to Judge Garson being arrested and convicted of accepting bribes. In 2007, he was sentenced to three to 10 years in prison. Number four, Thomas Maloney. Thomas Maloney's obituary in the Chicago Tribune says the first and remains the only Cook County judge to be convicted of rigging murder cases for cash. His reputation as a judge who could be bought followed him all the way to his grave. He became known for his corruption shortly after being elected to his office in 1977. While Maloney's public image was that of a strict judge that despised gangsters, even referring to them as the lowest sort of cowards, he regularly got mafia members and other criminals off in their cases. 
Jesus. Maloney used a bag man as an intermediary between himself and whoever was trying to bribe him. Lucius Robinson's bailiff was his bag man for years. When he eventually got swept up in an ongoing FBI investigation into Judge Maloney, a man named Robert McGee took over. Finally, the FBI came knocking on Maloney's door with information that he was the judge accepting bribes. Maloney quickly came up with a story to defend himself. He alleged that Robinson and McGee took the money themselves and never actually bribed him at all. However, the investigation found evidence to the contrary. Maloney was convicted on four counts of accepting bribes, three of which were in murder cases. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 1994, but only served 12. His conviction had far-reaching consequences as all of the cases he tried came into question. Some of the convicted people had their cases reopened for a bribery investigation. His arrest was part of a much larger FBI operation named Operation Greylord. By the end of it, 17 different judges were convicted of corruption. Number three, Donna Davenport. Typically, offenders are guaranteed innocent until proven guilty. However, under the policies of Judge Donna Davenport, over 1,000 children were criminally mistreated. In Tennessee, Judge Davenport presided over the juvenile court in Rutherford County. She was well known for being a callous judge that seemed to take pride in her harsh punishments of children. She believed that rehabilitation could be gained through harsh treatment, tough love, if you will. To enact what she saw as justice, she created policies that allowed children to be arrested and brought to a detention center with out evidence to support their arrests. Generally, if a child is accused of a crime, they're brought to court with their parents to assess their guilt. In 2016, multiple children were charged with criminal responsibility for the conduct of another for not stopping a fight that was caught on video. There's only one problem. That charge does not exist. Attorney Frank Brazil said in an interview with ABC News, quote, so that being applied as a charge in and of itself is unlawful. A radio station and a website started the investigation that ultimately stopped the perversion of the justice system. The youngest of Davenport's victims were around eight and nine years old. Rutherford County agreed to pay $7.75 million to the wrongfully arrested and detained children. Davenport lost her job as a teacher at Middle Tennessee State University, and her policies have since been stopped. Sadly, the real world Dolores Umbridge still presides over Rutherford County Juvenile Court. Number two, Tracy Hunter. Tracy Hunter was a juvenile court judge in Hamilton County, Ohio, who abused her power in multiple ways. Her beginning as a judge was controversial, as she got the position almost two years after it was filled. A lawsuit Hunter submitted to recount the votes went through, and she was awarded the position as the new winner. Once in office, it wasn't too long before she came under fire for tampering with documents. By the time 2014 came around, she was indicted on eight felony charges. She backdated documents so lawyers couldn't appeal her decisions in time to stop them. She also used a credit card that wasn't hers to pay for her legal troubles. It seemed like trouble ran in the family. Her brother, who worked at the courthouse, was in the process of being fired for punching a teen. She took documents that might benefit her brother and tried to give them to his attorney, which was a big no-no. In October of 2014, Judge Hunter was convicted on one count for providing her brother with documents. However, the jurors couldn't come to an agreement on the rest of the charges so they were dropped. She was sentenced to six months in jail, but she had one last show for everyone in the courtroom. When the former judge heard her verdict, she decided that she wasn't going and had to be dragged out of the courtroom. Number one, Joe Brown. Anyone who watched daytime TV in the early 2000s would recognize Judge Joe Brown from his popular court show. He also had experience as a lawyer, and when asked by a lady to help in her custody case, he agreed. Brown and his client showed up for court, but were told their case was not on the schedule. Brown didn't take that news lightly and threw a temper tantrum in the courtroom. After a moment of loud banter where he was warned that he would be in contempt of court, he ended up exactly that. Brown was removed from the courtroom and arrested on charges of contempt contempt. He was released later that same day under his own reconnaissance. In 2020 and 2021, Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein was charged and convicted for conspiracy to defraud the government and wire fraud. He's a revered holy man, a religious leader, and the last person on earth anyone would expect to commit a felony. So why did he do it? And who else was involved in Goldstein's elaborate tax scheme? Decades before he ever committed fraud, Goldstein worked as a rabbi, preaching out of a store front and a suburban shopping center in northern San Diego. The desert hills were a slight change from the crowded streets of Brooklyn, but 
Goldstein adapted quickly and established his synagogue, the Shabbat of Poway. By 2019, the synagogue grew to become a significant presence in the Jewish community. That same year, a 19-year-old named John T. Ernest walked into the synagogue building during Goldstein's Passover service and opened fire. The shooting left Goldstein with permanent damage to his hands. Ernest was apprehended after his gun jammed. In the aftermath of the shooting, Goldstein and his congregation found themselves gracing national headlines. Goldstein was praised for his strong leadership and calls for peace in a time of anger, pain, and fear. He would stand in front of traumatized crowds of people, his fragmented hands wrapped in blue bandages, and offer words of peaceful wisdom to anyone listening. At one point, he even got to meet President Trump. However, underneath the strong community leadership exhibited by Goldstein, there was a multi-million dollar tax fraud operation deep in the cellar. While the media focused on the shooting, Goldstein was in the middle of an FBI investigation. One year and three months after the deadly synagogue shooting, Rabbi Goldstein pleaded guilty to several counts of fraud. In the blink of an eye, Goldstein went from being praised to vilify. His reputation was forever tainted when the shocking details of his crimes were released to the public. But he wasn't the only one. In 2008, Ellis donated $1,000 to Friendship Circle, a charity focused on assisting kids with disabilities. Friendship Circle is located on the Shabbat community property and overseen by the Shabbat's founder, Rabbi Goldstein. The rabbi, however, did not accept Ellis's donation so much as he requested it. Ellis, 42, was at Qualcomm, a California computer chip manufacturer. He served as a low-level manager when Goldstein initially asked the 29-year-old Ellis to help out with some local kids in need. Goldstein took donations from Ellis again in 2009 and again in 2010. Ellis continued donating to Goldstein's charities until 2019, by which time his annual contributions had grown to $5,000. In addition to the donations, Ellis wrote off $55,600 worth of daycare tuition from the Shabbat Community Center Child Care Services for five years straight. How did Ellis manage to write off so much money through a child care tax deduction? The truth is, he didn't. All the donations and write off were fraudulent. The first $1,000 Ellis donated was returned to the Qualcomm manager with a receipt to give to the IRS. And of that $1,000 Goldstein returned, the rabbi kept around 10% of it himself. Experts call this an old fashioned 90 10 tax scheme. Ellis's reward came from Goldstein's donation receipts, which he used to avoid paying paying $1,000 and eventually $5,000. In total, from 2008 to 2019, Ellis avoided paying $27,000 in taxes. But he wasn't the only employee from Qualcomm uh, donating to Goldstein's charities. Another Qualcomm employee, Rodham Cooper, was also responsible for defrauding the IRS out of $27,000. Both his and Ellis' schemes have much in common. They both worked at Qualcomm and owed their former employer a lot of money. Cooper, who worked as an engineering manager, began taking advantage of Qualcomm's donation matching policy. Ellis continued to pull the same scam when he got promoted to a mid-level management position in 2016, which meant Qualcomm would match any donation up to $5,000. A big step up from the initial $1,000 contributions Ellis pretended to give back in 2008. All the money Qualcomm donated fell right into the pockets of Cooper and Ellis, with a small portion going to Goldstein. While $54,000 might sound like a lot, Cooper and Ellis have nothing on another scheme participant named Stuart Weinstock. Unlike the previous scheme participants, Weinstock, currently 64, owned his own business, a small grocery store called Salsa Market. Beginning in 2010, Weinstock began meeting monthly with Goldstein. During those meetings, the rabbi and Weinstock would make their exchanges. Suddenly, Weinstock became highly charitable, on paper at least. Investigators found that Weinstock was donating around $8,000 a month to Goldstein's charities. According to prosecutors, the rabbi was taking a much higher percentage of Weinstock's donations. Of the roughly $8,000 Goldstein took from Weinstock, he sliced off a 25% chunk and kept that for himself, leaving his donor with roughly $6,000. And, just like Cooper and Ellis, Weinstock used the donation receipts to write off large sums of money on his taxes. But how much? Weinstock ceased his tax fraud operation in 2018. By that point, authorities believe Weinstock defrauded the government out of at least $180,000, with some estimates putting the total amount at a quarter million. Overall, investigators believe that from 2010 to 2018, Weinstock donated more than $870,000 to the Shabbat. Of that $870,000, $650,000 was given back to him by Rabbi Goldstein alongside the deductible receipts. Weinstock would also claim the checks he sent to Goldstein were business expenses just to shake it up from time to time. 
Though he contributed a massive percentage of the money to Goldstein's scheme, Weinstock was by no means the only other participant. Several minor players pleaded guilty to participating in Goldstein's 90-10 tax scam, even someone related to the disgraced rabbi. Cooper, Ellis, and Weinstock were the more notable participants who pleaded guilty. Prosecutors have a list of around two dozen other individuals, including some of the largest fraudsters by capital, Dr. Bruce Baker, Alexander Avergoon, and Mendel Goldstein, Rabbi Goldstein's older brother. Dr. Bruce's scheme was a bit different from the others. For starters, his numbers are higher. Investigators believe the 75-year-old pediatric dentist was responsible for not paying $644,000 in taxes. His fake donations amount to over $2 million. Goldstein's bogus contributions amounted to $6.4 million total, making Dr. Baker responsible for around one-third of them. But unlike the other conspirators, Dr. Baker never got his donations back. Instead, he allowed Goldstein to spend his money for him. Dr. Baker instructed Goldstein to pay for menial things, such as his children's private school tuition and dental school tuition. Goldstein also distributed cash to Dr. Baker's relatives, among several other large purchases, like paying off creditors. Another way Dr. Baker differed from his fellow donors was that not all his donations came in cash. For example, Dr. Baker donated an ancient Torah worth $1.2 million to a charity run by a mysterious person known to investigators as YF. In truth, however, the Torah never existed. Dr. Baker pleaded guilty to his crimes and was later sentenced to 15 months in custody. The dentist's age probably kept him from suffering a harsher sentence. Other scheme participants may not be so lucky. One such participant is Alexander Avergoon. In 2019, Alexander Avergoon was found in Latvia, a small country in northeastern Europe, and extradited to the United States. Since then, Avergoon has been convicted of his crimes. But despite the court's conviction, Avergoon's sentence hearings continue to get pushed back, despite pleading guilty to several different white-collar criminal charges after being indicted in 2019. Most of those charges have absolutely nothing to do with Goldstein and carry with them a max 20-year sentence. In San Diego, locals knew Avergoon as a real estate agent. To Goldstein, on the other hand, Avergoon was his salesman. He helped Goldstein recruit new donors for the scheme. Prosecutors believe Avergoon helped talk nine taxpayers into donating $275,000 from 2010 to 2015. Avergoon also helped Goldstein pay them back. However, his involvement went beyond just operating the scheme. Avergoon lent his expertise to Goldstein by helping him orchestrate a giant fraud scheme which involved obtaining money from agencies like the Federal Emergency Management Agency, more commonly known as FEMA. It worked like this. Goldstein would request grant money for repairs, security upgrades, and community programs from FEMA, but keep the money instead of spending it on the Shabbat. Thanks to Avergoon's expertise in fabricating documents, Goldstein and his young partner stole $875,000 from FEMA and other government agencies who presumed they were aiding a proactive religious organization. As criminal as those actions were, they are not enough to get you 20 years in an orange jumpsuit. Avergoon, the San Diego real estate agent, spent 2010 to 2016 running a retirement investor Ponzi scheme. In total, he cheated his retired victims out of $12 million. Mendel never lived in San Diego, but is believed to have defrauded as much money as Avergoon. On the surface, Mendel appeared to be a regular resident of Brooklyn, where he and his brother grew up together. There, he owned and operated a videography business, a business the rabbi wanted a piece of. So, in 2012, Rabbi Goldstein proposed a partnership with his brother's business and the Shabbat of Poway. He planned to funnel Mendel's videography freelance revenue into Shabbat-owned bank accounts where they would go undetected by the IRS and into Mendel's pockets through phony checks. In the end, genetics and greed won out, and Mendel agreed to the deal. The checks started flooding in. According to the DOJ, they were signed by individuals named Mr. Green and Mr. Fish. Not suspicious at all, right? When the partnership ended in 2018, Mendel had evaded $155,000 worth of taxes. Mendel later told law enforcement that he stopped sending his money to San Diego because he learned IRS investigators were inspecting him for tax evasion. Nevertheless, he still got caught. And though Mendel's part in the scheme is interesting, a few other convicted schemers are worth mentioning. The first dishonorable mention is 55-year-old Igor Stilkind. Igor worked for an aerospace and defense technology company based in San Diego. 
similar to Ellis and Cooper, Igor managed to get his company to match donations and ended up defrauding them out of $17,500 over 10 years. Boris Schkoller, who was 29 years older than our first dishonorable mention, did not let age get in the way of committing fraud. He'd eventually plead guilty, but received a life sentence of just one year's probation. Yusef Shemirani, the third dishonorable mention, did not fare as well as Boris. The court ordered Yusef to pay a $10,000 fine and punished him with two years probation. These are all small prices to pay compared to what Rabbi Goldstein is facing. His sentence has repeatedly been postponed and rescheduled since his conviction. When he is eventually sentenced, Goldstein faces up to five years in prison. But while he is attending court, who is running the synagogue? Some believe that the rabbi has not entirely relinquished control of his community. Before his guilty pleas in 2020, 20, Rabbi Goldstein fully controlled both the Shabbat and Friendship Circle. However, when Goldstein left his synagogue in handcuffs, his son Mendel, who was named after his uncle, took over day-to-day -day operations. Upon his ascension to power in July of 2020, Mendel promised to transfer control of Friendship Circle to a group of donors, volunteers, and founders. Except, he did none of those things. Instead, Mendel handed the reins to his brother, Shui. One of the founders of Friendship Circle, Elisheva Green, took notice and, in turn, took his name off the organization he founded. He could no longer be a part of an organization whose goals didn't match its results. In other words, he believed the Friendship Circle's sole purpose was to provide income for Rabbi Goldstein's son and FC's new leader, Yoshua Shui Goldstein, who had zero experience running a nonprofit or any organization for that matter. There is no hard evidence to suggest Rabbi Goldstein is still running the Shabbat of Poway. However, it's easy to prove his family is still running it, a factor Green doesn't see changing anytime soon, despite their patriarch's infamous tax fraud scheme. No Perez was a new lawyer when he first met Judge Rudolfo Delgado. He said he was intimidated by the man and his position. Maybe that contributed to his choice to get involved with Delgado on a bribery scheme. In 2008, Perez had a client who didn't have the money to pay for his services. So instead, he compensated the new lawyer with a $15,000 truck. When Delgado got word of this, he approached Perez about purchasing the truck. Usually, judges and lawyers don't make business deals due to the conflict of interest it may raise in court, but this didn't stop Delgado. Perez later stated that he felt too intimidated to accept the money and just gave the truck to the judge. Hidalgo County was named after the famous priest and leader of the Mexican War of Independence, Miguel Hidalgo. Once founded, the county maintained a heavy Hispanic population of 91.9% that's still present today. The Hispanic presence can be seen throughout the culture that the Mexican-Americans living there surround themselves with. Sitting right on the border allowed Hidalgo County to be a mixing point for people of two very different countries to come together and make something new. With the population steadily growing, they needed a representative that would look out for their needs. Rodolfo Delgado was elected to the 93rd District Court in 2000. In his position, he was supposed to protect the people of Hidalgo, but instead, he betrayed their trust. For years, Delgado seemed like an average judge who decided every case by the book. His career was flawless until his downfall in 2019, which authorities believe started after a seemingly simple truck purchase. It wasn't until later that Perez realized he had just bought himself credit in the court of Delgado and that his decision would change the course of both of their lives. This began an eight-year relationship where a few bribes took place to swing things favorably in Perez's client's direction. Once authorities became aware of the situation, it wasn't hard for investigators to collect evidence on Delgado. They had multiple videos that showed him being asked for favors while accepting donations. Perez's involvement made him a prime candidate for working as an informant. It was an easy decision for Perez once the FBI started breathing down his neck. In the FBI's criminal complaint against Delgado, he and Perez's scheme was revealed. They would set up their meetings by phone and only talk to each other in code words when speaking about the bribes. These payments were always made in person and in cash or items. Delgado's scheme seemed more like an opportunity than a planned out crime. Once it was clear between Delgado and Perez what the deal was going to be, the bribes became a regular thing. During the eight-year scheme, Delgado accepted more than $20,000 worth of known bribes if you include the pickup truck. The cash bribes ranged in value. Some were only a few hundred bucks, while others were north of 5,000. 
Perez hid the money in six packs of beer to keep things appearing innocent. To wandering eyes, it looked like two friends discussing case law over a few beers. Sure, bribes don't have to be made in cash. In fact, one could argue that a six pack constitutes an unethical gift. But think about it. If police investigated every lawyer, politician, or business person that bought someone a drink, there'd be prisons full of guilty bribe makers. The payoffs provided Perez and his clients with multiple advantages in the crooked officials' court. These same favors contributed heavily to Delgado's eventual arrest, as they could be confirmed through court records. These favors included getting his clients out on personal recognizance bonds, which basically is free bail. In short, Clients promised to show up for their court date without putting anything up for collateral. Perez enjoyed the benefits of having a judge nestled right in his pocket, while Delgado enjoyed his gifts and money. However, it would be this very relationship that brought the delusion to a screeching halt. When Perez became the star witness against the former judge, their path to prison was pretty much paved. Once the FBI had Perez working for them as a confidential human source, they began setting up a sting operation. The focus of the whole orchestration was to build a case against Delgado by gathering obvious evidence of his crimes. Perez made several phone calls to Delgado while the FBI listened. In these recorded phone calls, the corrupt judge can be heard setting up meetings to accept bribe money. Delgado didn't know that the FBI provided Perez with the money that he used to bribe him with each time. Then they confirmed that the clients were let out on bond right after the bribes were accepted through court records. On January 17, 2018, Perez placed another call to the judge. When the two spoke, they set up a meeting at a restaurant where yet another bribe would occur. When he arrived at the restaurant, Perez was ready to make one last deal. The FBI had given him over $5,000 in a white envelope and equipped him with a wire so they could record the conversation. He texted Delgado and asked him to come outside with money in hand. When the former judge got into the vehicle, Perez explained that he had a case he needed help with in exchange for the money. Delgado accepted and took the money with him. The FBI observed and confirmed all of this, which put the final pin in their case against him. With all the heat on his back, it was evident that Delgado had to step down from his position as a judge. No matter how the investigation and trial went, it would be devastating blow to his reputation. However, this wasn't enough to stop the conniving judge as he was elected for another position. In 2018, Delgado won the election for the 13th Court of Appeals for the state of Texas. Even with all the trouble surrounding him and his pending trial looming overhead, Delgado was able to come out on top again. The position didn't last long, but how exactly did he get voted in? The answer is straight ticket voting, and it's a relatively simple concept. Basically, it allows someone to vote for everyone aligned with their party by checking one box on the ballot. This meant that Delgado didn't have to do any campaigning. He carried no social media presence and was not seen holding any events. Since he was the only Democrat running for the position, anybody who checked the straight ticket box automatically voted for him. Had they known about the bribery charges looming over his head, they may have voted differently. Delgado didn't need to be clean to win. Instead, he hid behind his party and rode their coattails to victory. He was sworn into office in January of 2019, but was suspended in the same month. Of course, his past caught up with him overnight once everyone realized what had happened. Delgado's attorneys did their best trying to defend their client by questioning the evidence. They argued that anything could have been in the envelopes Delgado got from Perez. During the investigation, Delgado was tipped off about it and tried to undermine the whole thing. He sent a message to Perez asking for the money in check form. He also told Perez to call it a donation. Of course, none of these arguments worked. In the end, the judge and lawyer were both convicted and charged for their crimes. Special Agent Christopher Combs of the FBI was quoted as saying, The sentencing of Delgado sends a strong message to any public official who chooses to serve him or herself rather than their community. As this case illustrates, the FBI will tirelessly pursue those who betrayed the public trust. We can only hold corrupt officials accountable if people refuse to accept this behavior and are willing to cooperate and come forward with information. No Perez was given two years in federal prison while Delgado was sentenced to six. Delgado was convicted on multiple counts of bribery, conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. Perez's sentence would have been worse, but the court gave him leniency for his cooperation with the FBI. 
He was also supposed to face a disciplinary hearing where he would likely have lost his law license. Instead of facing the music, Perez decided to resign from the position. Delgado's wife, Diana, took the stand at the emotional trial. The defense used the family's turbulent past to explain the judge's actions, which unveiled a heartbreaking story. It all boiled down to that $15,000 truck that started it all. In 2007, Rico Delgado, their eldest son, totaled his car in a fatal accident. Sadly, Roman Delgado, the youngest son, was killed in the crash. The couple was looking for a new truck for Rico, and Perez just happened to have one he was willing to part with. No documented evidence of purchase existed, as Perez handed over the truck believing it'd buy him favors in court. However, Rico's life continued to spiral after the accident, as he suffered from substance abuse. Sadly, Rico passed away in 2017. The defense asked the jury to consider the whole story when making their decisions. It's clear the Delgados were going through a lot as a family, but that didn't change the fact that he accepted bribes in court. Delgado and Perez's scheme affected many people, turning them into victims of a crime they didn't know was being committed. Delgado's greed hurt anyone whose trial was affected by bribery. Just like a rock hitting a pond, the ripples from their actions continued to reach out and touch others. Once Perez was convicted of his crimes and sentenced to prison, everything began to fall apart for his clients. It was discovered that he had had hundreds of open cases, all with clients who were unsure of their future or even how to handle the unique situation. All of their calls and questions were left unanswered while he tried to figure out what to do about their legal situations. Reporters visited Perez's office only to discover it covered in caution tape with a for sale sign hanging on the door. Answers were found for the group of victims when Channel 5 News interviewed local attorney Chris Caveos. He stated that the best thing to do was think carefully about their actions. The client would have to send a formal letter to Perez's office and then send the same letter to the state bar. He harped on the importance of showing up to court whether or not they receive an answer. Your crimes don't magically disappear when your lawyer gets arrested. African leaders who rob their countries blind. Number eight, Idi Amin. Idi Amin controlled Uganda for just eight years, but during those eight years, he managed to become one of the most brutal dictators in African history. And not only was he violent and genocidal, but he was utterly insane as well. Amin redirected most of the country's money to himself and the military. He was fine with leaving the rest of the country in extreme poverty. Amin took so much of Uganda's money for himself that by the time he was finally kicked out, inflation had gone up 1,000%. As bad as that sounds, this was really the least of Uganda's problems while this lunatic was running the show. When the United Kingdom broke off diplomatic relations with him in 1977, Amin decided to take it as a personal victory. He gave himself the title Conqueror of the British Empire. This was added to his lengthy title, which became His Excellency, President for Life, Field Marshal Al Haji Dr. Idi Amin Dada, VC DSO MC CBE, Lord of all beasts of the earth and fishes of the sea, and Conqueror of the British Empire in Africa in general and Uganda in particular. We love Game of Thrones. He also claimed to be the uncrowned king of Scotland. That would be pretty funny if he hadn't also taken hundreds of thousands of lives. It was widely believed at the time that Amin was a cannibal. However, Amin himself said that humans were too salty for his taste. He enjoyed boasting that he had his political enemies in his freezer. Number 7. Omar al-Bashir Omar al-Bashir was the head of Sudan for 30 years until his reign came to an abrupt end thanks to a coup. He wasn't a popular guy. Al-Bashir got elected in the first place because he most likely rigged the election. Then he ended up becoming the first sitting head of state to be indicted by the International Criminal Court. His time in office was filled with war, even though he vowed to end the civil war when he got elected, a civil war that had been going on for 21 years. Al-Bashir took advantage of the chaos to loot the already impoverished nation of all the wealth it had left. According to WikiLeaks, he sent $9 billion to a secret London bank account. 
Al-Bashir's big plan to help out Sudan and the entire continent of Africa was to create a space agency. In 2012, he said that if Africa could all come together to make their own space agency, it would liberate the continent from technological domination. He never really explained how that would work or how that would help. For instance, the ongoing civil war. This was either a desperate distraction or a sign that he was truly delusional and out of touch. That nine billion probably would have helped. Number six, Hosni Mubarak. Hosni Mubarak was the longest serving president that Egypt ever had. He ran the country from 1981 to 2011. During that time, he made a very suspicious amount of money. There's never been an official number, but he was worth somewhere between 40 and 70 billion dollars, according to experts. His massive fortune likely stems from corruption and bribes, as well as legitimate business activities. The money was spread out in different banks and properties all over the world. Usually, people who make legitimate money don't have bank accounts in three countries, including Switzerland. Corruption skyrocketed during Mubarak's reign as president. Rival politicians and activists who opposed him would be imprisoned without trial. He created illegal hidden prisons for his enemies. It became difficult to get a job at a university, mosque, or newspaper if you had views that he didn't like. It's not too hard to imagine someone who runs a country like this might be running some scams on the side. In 2011, Switzerland froze his bank accounts and the accounts of anyone related to him. A few years later, when Mubarak was out of office, a court convicted him and his sons of embezzling $17.6 million. The money was supposed to be used for renovating and maintaining the presidential palace. Instead, it was secretly used for upgrading private family mansions. Without presidential authority to keep himself out of trouble, Mubarak was sentenced to three years in prison. Number 5. Sani Abacha Sani Abacha was a Nigerian general who became head of state after overthrowing the government in a military coup. Under his rule, Nigeria made unprecedented economic advances. However, like the fictional Nigerian princes from the internet, he also stole a lot of money from the people. On the surface, things seemed to be going well. He increased Nigeria's foreign exchange reserve to $9.6 billion. He also reduced the country's debt by $9 billion and reduced the inflation rate down to 8.5%. That may seem pretty high, but considering it had been hovering at around 54%, it's actually amazing. All that was good, but Abacha was also involved in some majorly corrupt activities. Nigeria's main export is oil. When Abacha came to power, he took control of nearly all of it. The country made about $10 billion a year from oil sales, and 80% of Nigerian government revenue came from oil. Oil also turned out to be a great way for Abacha to make money. He siphoned some of this oil revenue right into his own accounts. That revenue equated to $4 billion stolen from the government. $4 billion is a lot of money in America, but it's a ton in Nigeria, where the GDP per capita was less than $3,000. Number 4. Dos Santos Family Jose Eduardo Dos Santos was the president of Angola for 38 years. And during those 38 years, he pretty much ran the country like it was his personal investment fund. Under his rule, Angola became one of the most corrupt countries in Africa. Even though most people in Angola live on less than $2 a day, Santos focused on other problems while he was in charge. Issues such as making himself and his friends as rich as possible. After the Angolan civil wars, Santos took personal control of various emerging companies and industries. He was making so much money that a leak exposed 400 companies involved in laundering it all for him. Corruption runs in the family. Isabel dos Santos, his daughter, was the richest woman in Africa at one point. Her net worth was over $2 billion, according to Forbes. However, they took her off the official list when her assets were frozen in Angola, Portugal, and the Netherlands. This is because all of that money came from her father's government scams. She currently owns a Portuguese company worth roughly $340 million. She's made the United Arab Emirates her official country of residence to avoid being shipped back to Angola and going to jail. Their family stole from their starving people. Check out our full video on the former richest woman in Africa and her corrupt family here. Number 3. Jacob Zuma Jacob Zuma, a former president of South Africa, is currently at the center of a vast and messy trial. He's facing criminal charges related to a corrupt arms deal in his country made in 1999. He's been in and out of court ever since. After all, it's harder to convict a former president than to lock up some random civilian. Former presidents tend to have pretty good legal teams. He's being charged with multiple counts of corruption, racketeering, and money laundering. It all goes back to the 783 payments he received. 
Those payments were most likely bribes from a French weapons company named Thales. Before anyone claimed corrupt dealings were going down on the side, the arms deal was very controversial. When he was president, Zuma spent billions of dollars on new fighter jets, helicopters, submarines, and warships. Many South African countries saw this crazy military spending as unnecessary, especially since the more pressing problem was that most of their people lived in poverty. He took a page out of the United States budget playbook and increased defense spending, even though they weren't at war with anyone. There have only been two convictions in over 20 years. Tony Hengeni, who was a parliamentary whip, was found guilty of fraud. He lied to Parliament about a luxury car discount from a company bidding on weapons contracts. Both were a bad look for Tony. Financial advisor Shabir Sheikh went to jail for 15 years after taking a bribe on Zuma's behalf from an arms company. What a lot of South Africans really want, however, is to see Zuma himself behind bars. Number 2. Teodoran Nguama Obiang Teodoran Nguama Obiang, nicknamed Teodoran, is the current vice president of Equatorial Guinea. He's been the vice president since 2012, which should be the first indication that democracy isn't going according to plan in Equatorial Guinea. He's the son of Teodoro Obiang, the de facto dictator of the country. When your dad runs the whole country, it's pretty easy to get a job. Teodoran has held all kinds of government positions, including Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, and second vice president. Some people think it's a position his dad invented for him. It's sort of like assistant to the regional manager. Teodoran is best known for his lavish and taxpayer-funded lifestyle. He's not super involved in politics, but he does enjoy renting super yachts and having parties with rappers on them. He also attracted a lot of criticism when he spent almost half a million dollars in one weekend in South Africa. How does one manage to spend so much money so fast? Well, champagne, two Bentleys, and a Lamborghini Murcielago can add up fast. According to American agencies looking for Teodoran, most of, if not all of his wealth, doesn't come from his official government salary. Most of it likely comes from corrupt deals with the oil and gas companies that control the country's lucrative reserves. The money could probably go a long way towards helping the actual citizens of Equatorial Guinea. Still, cars are pretty neat too. His spending finally caught up with him in 2007, when several organizations filed criminal complaints against Teodoran, accusing his family of embezzling money to spend on French luxury properties. For the next 10 years, authorities seized luxury cars from the Obiang family, including two Bugatti Veyrons, an Aston Martin, and a Ferrari Enzo. 25 luxury cars were seized and auctioned off for $27 million. In 2021, a French appeals court convicted Teodoran of embezzlement, slapping him with a three-year suspended sentence. He'll never see the inside of a jail cell, but he'll have to pay a 30 million euro fine. Number 1. Mswati III Mswati III is the king of Eswatini and head of the Swazi royal family. He became king in 1986 when he was only 18 years old. Being an absolute ruler for his entire adult life hasn't left him with much empathy and understanding for the people in the country he rules. M. Swati currently has 15 wives and 36 children. He got one of those 15 wives by kidnapping her from high school, forcing her to marry him and live in the royal village forever. But what he's been criticized for the most is his absurdly lavish lifestyle. In the country's 2014 national budget, parliament allocated $61 million for the king's annual household budget. Meanwhile, 63% of his subjects live on less than $2 per day, and 40% are unemployed. His purchase of a Maybach 62 for half a million dollars also got him into trouble with the media. His solution wasn't to change his spending habits or reform anything. Instead, he made it illegal for anyone to take pictures of the car. In 2004, the king requested $15 million from the government so that he could redecorate some palaces and build some new ones for his wives. That same year, there were public protests against an expensive shopping spree that nine of his wives had gone on. They pose on Instagram with high-end Mercedes and Porsches, cars they are forced to keep in Dubai to hide them from the people of Eswatini. Meanwhile, Mswati doesn't seem particularly worried that his country has one of the lowest average life expectancies in the world. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comments section who's the worst leader in charge right now.